Okay. Um, today's uh, speaker is Professor Jan Hastevan uh, from EPFL. He joined uh, EPFL as Chair of Computational Mathematics and Simulation Science in 2013, and since 2017 as Dean of the School of Basic Sciences. His research interests focus on the development analysis and application of high order accurate methods for the solution of complex time dependent problems, often requiring high performance computing. A particular focus of his research has been on the development of computational methods for problems of linear and nonlinear wave problems and the development of reduced basis methods. Recently, with an emphasis on combining traditional methods with machine learning and neural networks with broad applications, including structural health monitoring. He has received several awards for both uh, his research and his teaching, and has published four monographs and more than 160 research papers. He is on the editorial board of eight journals and serves as editor in chief of Cyan Scientific Computing. No further ado, um, uh, here is our speaker, Professor Hestevan. He is going to talk about non-intrusive reduced total model using physics informed neural neural networks uh, today. Uh, okay. Uh, please enjoy. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for the for the kind invitation and the opportunity. Um, as I mentioned, this is a, an after-dinner speech, at least in this in this uh, part of the world. But I know it's not for you, so I will I will not make a more sort of relaxed after-dinner speech, but a but a regular scientific presentation. Um, so I'll I'll talk about uh, <clears throat> using reduced order models, and some of you may know them, and some of you perhaps have only heard about them. Um, uh, focusing on nonlinear problems in particular. Um, and, and trying to, to discuss how one can use neural networks of, of various types uh, to solve some of the bottlenecks that are associated with developing reduced order models for time dependent problems, nonlinear problems in particular. So that's sort of the <clears throat> this philosophy uh, that I've taken in the last few years that when trying to do look at neural nets or machine learning technology, it's not to replace what many of us have spent many years learning and and 75 years of, of numerical analysis, but rather to try and understand whether we can use this technology to to solve some of the bottlenecks that we are traditionally facing when we when we try to solve more complex problems. So so what is the reduced order model? I am sure that many of you are familiar with it. Uh, it is basically uh, a, an attempt to create a map between a set of parameters, mu, boundary conditions, initial conditions, material parameters, geometries, what have you. <clears throat> then there's a PDE or system of PDEs in there that describes the relationship between the parameters and an output of interest, solution. Um, and of course, you can solve it using a standard methods, and and you being at Lawrence Livermore knows uh, better than anyone that some of these problems are extremely time-consuming to solve, and and the idea of having to solve them ten thousand times is, is sort of completely out of the question. Uh, so the question is, can you come up with a with a way of creating this map uh, so that when you, if you are willing to to simplify your your view or focus your view on a particular class of problems that you can accelerate um, the solver. So basically, you're, you're, you're trading generality for speed, as we so often do. Uh, so just to give you an example of, of what the basic idea is, let's say you have Poisson's problem here with the right-hand side f that depends on some parameters mu. It can also be the boundary conditions. And the point is you wish to solve this many, many times. Of course, you can use your favorite method, finite element, finite difference, perhaps uh, perhaps a spectral method, whatever you prefer. Um, but if the problem is a complicated problem, you need many degrees of freedom, uh, the curly n, uh, and therefore, even with the modern technology, if A is big enough, uh, it becomes expensive. 
And so the question is, if this is the problem you're interested in, can you do better than that? And the idea of a reduced order model is that you're saying, well, let me assume that, that I can represent my solution as it changes over parameter space uh, as a linear combination of some uh, vectors, which is uh, the matrix V, which is tall and skinny. So it has curly N uh, number of rows, but Roman N number of columns. And therefore, the size of the vector A is Roman N, and we simply assume that Roman N is much, much smaller than uh, the number of degrees of freedom you have in the in the big problem. Another way of looking at it is, is on the right-hand side, the little figure, is you're basically saying that as you're changing the solution over the over the uh, parameter space, you have a solution manifold, and you're making an assumption that you can represent this manifold here in 2D with uh, with a linear space. Okay? Of course, this may not be the case, and then you have other problems, but let's assume that you can, and in many cases you can. Well, if that's the case, you simply do a projection, you represent the solution in this new basis, you project the residual uh, in a Golovkin projection, and you get a little system of equations now, which is, uh, in this particular case, the main uh, characteristic is that, that you have a problem, it's a dense problem, but it's only Roman N by Roman N. So if you think of the number of degrees of freedom in this big problem being 10,000, but you only need 10 vectors to span the linear space, you now have a 10 by 10 dense problem you have to solve every time you change the parameter mu. This is the basic idea of reduced basis methods, um, as you as you can see them in, in in many in many different places. Why would you want to do that? Well, any problem where you need to solve the parameterized PDE, optimization, control problems, databases, uncertainty quantification, it's also been used for as subscale models in in multi-scale modeling, and <clears throat> and many other uh, situations. In particular, if you want to solve uh, something on a, on a deployed platform, uh, computer graphics, for instance, then um, there's clear benef benefits in, in being able to do that because you have only a limited amount of computational resources. So that's the basic idea of a, of a reduced order model. Uh, it's very successful. It works very, very well for, for linear problems. If you're interested in this, and I put it up there because the book is free, um, so you can download this book. It goes through uh, all the basic theory for the basically mostly for the linear problem, and there's a nice uh, error theory, and there's a lot of things you can do with these methods. They work very well. You can also do it for some nonlinear problems. Navier-Stokes, in particular, has been done uh, quite a bit. Um, but once you get into non to sort of more general nonlinear problems, uh, you face the issue that uh, it is more compl it is more complicated. To, to achieve the acceleration that you hope for. And I'll show you a second why this is. And a second one, which is, which is obvious already in the, in the previous example, is that when you do this, this projection of the operator A, you have to actually know the operator. You have to have, to have access to the operator, which means you have to have access to the code, um, and therefore uh, creating the reduced order model becomes intrusive. And, uh, and this, uh, for certain types of codes, uh, either because they're legacy or because they're classified or because they're commercial codes, um, this is simply not uh, possible. So the question is, can we build methods that have many of the same characteristics but are non-intrusive? And, and, and what is the problem here with the non-linearity? Well, again, here's the generic problem. Now it's the linear problem again. L, depends on, uh, L operator depends on, on U. You express the solution U as a linear combination uh, of the vectors V, put it in, you do the Golovkin projection, and you get a small system that you can solve. And and the key point is you have a method which is independent of the number of degrees of freedom in uh, in the original problem, and therefore you have uh, acceleration. Now, if the problem is nonlinear, it's of course uh, much less obvious how to do it because when you form the projected operator. The projected operator depends on U, and therefore, in order to evaluate the operator L, you're going to have to recover U, and therefore, you now get a scheme which depends on the number of degrees of freedom in the vector U, 
And that's exactly what you wish to try and avoid because now um, the cost of forming and solving the reduced order model becomes comparable to that of solving the original problem and, and you sort of lost the benefits of, of, the, <clears throat> of the reduced order model, at least in many, in many cases. So the question is, can we, can we, can we try and, and see if there's a way around that? Now, I'll, I'll go through a number of examples. Uh, individuals here below have been involved at various uh, stages of the process. Um, uh, where we sort of first do a non-intrusive method, which is entirely data-driven. And I'll explain to you how we do that. Then in the next level, we will include the equation into the training and see that there can be some benefits to that. And then for the time-dependent problem, which is the last piece, the question is, if I'm going to build a reduced model and I'm going to run it in time, then what do I know if I go beyond the time that I have trained the model? Uh, so then you get into prediction. And, uh, and of course, if a, if a reduced order model for a time-dependent problem doesn't have any predictive value, then um, its, its usefulness is, is, uh, is less obvious. So um, we'll discuss this a little bit. So uh, first one, so what does it mean by, by non-intrusive? Well, as I hinted to, the idea is that you want to have, a, have the ability to, to, build, to build reduced order models where all you have is a piece of code that can provide you input-output. I give it a parameter, I get back the solution. Uh, I don't need to actually look inside the code. Uh, and as soon as you go down that, that step, you realize that you cannot form the, the reduced order problem by projection because you don't have access to the operators. And therefore the key problem becomes how do you go from finding, from choosing a parameter new to actually getting the expansion coefficients, if you will, that you then use to multiply onto the weights and get the um, reduce the, the get the solution. Okay, so that's exactly the point. And then, of course, what can you say about accuracy? So, um, so how would one do that? Well, the, the simplest way is that you do some sort of function approximation. You say here on the left, the solution u is a linear combination of the vectors v. The alpha depends on the parameters mu. I don't know how they uh, vary. If you do intrusive, you have an equation for how to find the alphas. Of course, another way is to do, you could attempt to do interpolation, simply finding uh, alpha for a particular choice of the parameters, uh, and then use uh, radial basis functions or some sort of unstructured interpolation and, and, and do that. And, and of course, people have tried that, especially with radial basis functions, um, uh, and it has all the, the challenges that radial basis functions has, especially when you go up in high dimensions, uh, it gets quite poorly conditioned, uh, and it's expensive. It leads to large dense matrices that you have to solve. So that's not necessarily the, the, the best way. And, and so what we are proposing here in this one as well, so let's use a neural net for this exercise. So neural nets are known to be good for dealing with uh, with uh, high dimensional input output, uh, basically creating input output maps um, with the high dimensional uh, inputs and outputs. So in this case, the input would be the parameter values. It can be two or three, it can also be 100 if you're depending on the problem. And then on the right hand side, these will be the weights, what I call the alphas, and and then you will you will we will try to learn um, a neural net, a simple feedforward neural net that connects directly the parameters to the expansion coefficient. Okay, now, and we would use uh, we'll use super supervised learning for that. Okay, so the idea is, is quite simple. If you don't know what a neural net is, which I'm sure is the, is, is not the case here, well, it's it's basically uh, layers of what is called neurons here, which are which are linear functions of affine combinations of the solutions in the previous layer. Um, if there's more than one hidden layer, it's a deep neural net. Um, so uh, there's a number of choices you have to make. Um, 
in how you go from the inputs to the outputs. Those are the weights. Then there's a bias that you have to, to compute. And then there's an activation function. And it's the activation function that makes the, the neural net nonlinear. And so, so, so when you talk about training, what does it mean? Well, it means I have some input data and have some output data. And I have to try and find out what are the weights and what are the biases so that this function uh, uh, approximates the input output map as, as, as well as I can. Okay, so, and this is a, a nonlinear, uh, non convex uh, optimization problem that, that needs to be solved. So, so, the first thing you have to ask yourself is okay, so neural nets are used to all kinds of things. Why would you think that it would work in this context? Well, the thing is, as we just discussed, the neural net is really just a highly nonlinear approximation. And and uh, and the function we're trying to approximate is a function that maps the parameter space to the expansion coefficients. Now, if that's a very, very complicated function, it means that as I change the parameters a little bit, the expansion coefficients would change a lot. That would be a very sensitive and unpleasant problem, and it's it's very unlikely that there would be a good reduced basis for something like that. So it's entirely reasonable to assume that if there is a good reduced order model, that then this map is actually a relatively smooth map and a simple map. And therefore, we should, in fact, be able to create neural nets that are quite small um, that would allow you to um, to do that. And the forward problem we can solve as many as as, ma as much as we need. We can just so we can generate the data from the forward solver. We don't need to know the code. We just need to say, I give you the parameters, you give me the solution, I project the solution onto the linear space, I have the expansion coefficients, and I can generate as much data as I think I need. Now, of course. Every data set is a computation for the full solver. So we want to reduce that, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But in principle, you can generate the, the, um, the data that you need, and then once you have uh, trained, you can go. So let's see if it works. So this is the idea. We built the, the reduced order model exactly as we will do with a standard way, by taking snapshots or using a greedy approach, doing SVD. This gives you the vector, the, the vector space V and then sample parameter space to generate another set of snapshots. This is the training data. Use this for training the neural net. And then in the online phase, there's no projected problem. You simply evaluate the neural net uh, to, uh, to evaluate the nonlinear problem. So here's a couple of things. So this is a relatively simple problem. It's 1D, but it has some characteristics that I want to share with you because you will see it later on. So it's a, it's a 1D problem. Uh, for some problem, but it's a nonlinear problem, uh, as you can see. There are two parameters in the problem uh, on the boundary conditions. And uh, on the right are some, are some examples of solutions that are not so important. On the left is uh, sort of what we, what we need to look at here. So I'll spend a minute on that because we'll see the behavior. So the, the horizontal lines is the error that we make by taking a particular solution and projecting it on to um, as to the linear space um, of size either 8 or 15. In other words, this is the best accuracy we can get. This is the best accuracy you can get with the linear space of size 8 or 15. You cannot do better than that. Now, let's say the light blue. So that's the, that's the results that I get with uh, 50 training points. And the horizontal axis uh, signifies that I have two layers in the neural net, and then it is the number of neurons. These are very small neural nets, okay? And this is on purpose because I want to be fast. Um, so they're small neural nets, 10, 20, 30 neural nets, uh, neurons, two layers. And what you see is that, uh, in fact, as you increase the number of, of, of neurons uh, with only 30, with only 50 training points, in fact, the error goes up. Uh, now, if you increase the number of training points and do the same exercise, you see that the error sort of stays flat and then it goes up. And as you increase, as you as you add more and more training, you see that the solution eventually comes down, even with you have uh, a large neural net. So this 
as I'm sure many of you have, have, have seen, this is what is called over-parametrization. And it's, uh, it's in this particular case, what you're seeing is, uh, is overfitting. So when you don't have enough data for the richness of the, of the, of the neural net, uh, you're overfitting, you're basically interpolating, but it's a, it's a random grid, if you will. So you get very severe runge type phenomenon behavior. And then this is why the error goes up when you look at uh, over a test set in this case. Now, why is this useful? Well, because we can use this to actually design the the uh, the net, the architecture of the net. So if you look at the arrow, you can see that what we're interested in is the difference between the solution, the exact solution, and the predicted solution using the neural net. And we can split it into three with the with the triangle inequality. So as the first piece, so the first piece is the difference between the exact solution and the solution I would be computing if I'm using my big expensive solver. This is just a, this is an approximation, final element approximation theory. Uh, there's a lot of that. The next one is the error that I make by taking the computed solution and projecting it onto the space V. Okay, this is, a, this is an error component, and I have a third component, which is the error between the projected solution and the one predicting being predicted by the by the neural net. Okay, so the first two pieces are, are well quite well understood. How you can uh, represent those, understand those. The third one basically comes down to error analysis of the neural net. This is still uh, not something that is terribly well understood, especially when the, when the net is deep. Um, so we have an estimator like that. However, we're going to use overfitting now to try and control that error. We'll do it in the following way. So it's exactly the same problem as before. I have 100 training points. Um, now I increase the size of the network. Uh, from 10 to 15 neurons, the error goes down. That's good. Uh, it stagnates. And eventually, here with 25 nodes, you see the sign of overfitting. Now you can decide whether you think that uh, 6 times 10 to the minus 4 is good enough for what you're looking at. Uh, if it is, then you're done. Then you should be using a neural net with uh, two layers and 20 neurons. If not, the only way of, of improving matters is by increasing the number of training points. So we go to 200 training points. You see exactly the same trend. It goes down. Now we get down to the black line, which is the best we can hope for uh, in this particular test. And eventually, also here it goes up. So, so with this, you can you can at least in in, in this approach, you can basically define or, or help on the overfitting helps you understand what is the what is the appropriate size of the network. Now, of course, if you have a hundred layers and a billion neurons. I appreciate that this is a more difficult exercise, but I'm deliberately not looking at that limit. I'm looking in the limit of very small networks because I need them to be fast to do things on the fly. So here's a more complicated or slightly more complicated problem. Now there's Stokes 2D, uh, but with a non-affine mapping of the of the of the domain. Doing this with a standard fine that it's quite complicated uh, and, and it's not at all obvious how to do. Um, how to get this accelerated. Um, now, if you look at the solutions, so here's sort of eyeball solutions, you can see that they, they look fine. The top ones are the final elements, the bottom ones are the, are the reduced order model with the neural net. Um, if you look at the arrows, uh, exactly the same way as we talked about them, with having enough, uh, having enough of training data, depending on the size, you can certainly reach the accuracy that you that you want. Uh, and if you look at the actual arrows, um, rather than than um, than the generalization error, which is the the top one. So here, what we do is you you compute the the actual error of the solution as you increase the basis. So it's now the basis. Now the the red one is the projection of the ex, of the of, of the high fidelity solution. So this is the Let's say this is the best you can get. Um, the blue, the, the blue balls, the blue round balls. This is the this is the very expensive one where you go through the full Galerkin projection, so fully intrusive, and you see that the error goes down, um, at least on the velocity, which is the left. The pressure is on the right, but the nature of the nonlinear system that you have to solve is not very pleasant. It's extremely poorly conditioned. And therefore, you see uh, a fairly large error in this particular case. 
whereas the, the whereas the neural net um, works very well. It doesn't get quite as good as the as the projection of the high fidelity, but it gets very close, and uh, and you basically see um, almost exponential convergence in the in the reduced basis, which is what you would what you would expect. And of course, the issue here is the cost, which is the important one. Uh, if you do it fully intrusive with, um, with the uh compared to doing it with the with the training the neural net and using that in order to predict the errors or to, to predict the solution, there's an acceleration here of a factor of a thousand at least. And and, uh, and the training that goes into training the network because it's a relatively small network uh, is is marginal if indeed you need to solve the problem. Many many times. Um, so so the message here is that there's certainly something to be done by using the neural net to create directly the map between the parameters and the expansion coefficients. In this case, it was a purely data-driven approach, and you can. The beauty of it is you can do it for any problem, nonlinear, uh, and all you need is a black box solver, it's fully non-intrusive. Now, the problem with the approach I have just described is that it's difficult to get good accuracy. So if you need you know 10 to the if you need if 10% error is good or, or maybe if you work hard you can get down to 1% error then oh. then what i just described is is probably okay. Uh if you need more than that it it becomes very difficult to to do it you have to be very careful when you train and when you parameterize the network. Um and the second thing is and we have already seen that is that you need quite a bit of training data, you know, 200, 300, 400 uh, solutions for basically 2D Navier-Stokes. That's a that's a lot. Uh, so the question is, can we do something about that? And of course, the issue here is that there's something that we haven't used, and I'm focusing on steady state, but you can also do it for time dependent. There's something here that we haven't used, which is we haven't used the equation. We have only used data, um, and we do have an equation, of course. Uh, but in the first approach, we just used it, the, it to, to generate the data. So this gets very much into the spirit of, of what my former colleague, George Kanedakis, has been working on, on, on what, he, what he calls physics-informed neural nets, where, where you use the equation in the, in, the, um, in the training of the network. And so what I just described, and so now there are basically three different models here. So what I just described is one where you, you define the loss function as a loss function on the error that you make in predicting the expansion coefficients over parameter space. Okay, so O here is the neural net, alpha is your training data, and you try to train O so that you minimize this loss. It's a purely data-driven approach. Um, now, of course, the other way of trying to do things is, is what one could call, or what is called physics-informed neural nets, where you don't use the data, but you only use the residual. So you train to minimize uh, the, the, the prediction of the neural net such that uh, the residual is minimized. Um, uh, so you use the equation, but you actually never use the solution. Uh, and of course, it's natural to then think about, well, maybe you should do some sort of linear combination of the two where you both have a data-driven part and and a uh, physics informed part, um, and and so this is the approach that we take, and 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 we'll see quickly that in fact that seems to have some benefits uh, addressing the two problems that we talked about. So here's the the lid driven cavity again, um, parameters are Reynolds numbers as well as the angle, and this so this one is a little complicated. So let me spend a minute on this one. So um, so again the black line. Uh, are the projection of the exact solution as you increase the size of the basis. Okay, so think of the black lines as this is the best you can get. Uh, the, the yellow lines on top are three different this number of, of, uh, of um, amount of training data. They, they vary, but, but they but the point is this, you can see that, that here we have errors which are 10 to the minus two, maybe a little bit worse than that. And this is for the approach that I just described. So this is the purely data-driven approach. 
And here we see that it's difficult to get better than 10 to the minus 2 uh, accuracy, even if you pull in a lot of uh, training data. The red lines here in the middle of the, of, the, of the graph, this is the accuracy of the full Galoican approach, so the fully intrusive Galoican approach. So this, of course, behaves quite reasonably, um, but uh, is, is very, very expensive. Okay. The dashed lines, the dashed line is the residual, is the residual base, so this is the pin, it's the residual base only. And then the green line is the combination of the data and the residual. Now, why would that work better? Well, we all know that the residual is not the arrow. And if all the information that you give is only the residual, you can drift quite far away from the solution. So adding some solution, some actual solutions, a few data points to the, um, to the training actually can gain, in this case, an order of magnitude and accuracy with a relatively minimal uh, effort because those are the only snapshots that you need. So these are the full solutions. Everything else is just residual. Here are some visuals. And you, again, you can see that the neural nets are small, five layers, 30 neurons. Um, uh, so they are not big nets. Um, Natural convection, sort of a similar idea. But now we have three parameters in this case. The, the cavity can tilt. Um, and then there's the Rayla and the Prandtl number. And, and again, you see the same picture. You can see the colors and so on. The details are not so important. The point is that the yellow ones is the purely data-driven. The blue, the, the green dashed line is the purely residual based. Uh, and the green lines is the one where you combine them. Uh, in a reasonable way in order to, to, with the goal of reducing the need for many solutions uh, while doing better than simply using the residual. So, and again, you can, you can visually, the solutions are, are fine. So, so this sort of gives you a, gives, provides a path for using a combination of reduced order models and neural nets relatively simple feed-forward neural nets um, uh, that can be trained in various ways, in particular in the cost function, uh, in order to, to uh, take advantage of that. And of course, when you're training in the cost function, you're using also the, suit, the reduced order model to, to evaluate the, uh, the residual. So you see the acceleration of that also in training the reduced order model, in training the neural nets, sorry. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, is what to do about errors. So here's a, so now we're looking at time dependent problems. Uh, again, so here's a, a PDE on ODE. Let's say it's a PDE that you just could try somehow. We have found the linear space V. You do the projection, you get an equation for the expansion coefficients. They depend on time as well as the parameters. Here they're called omega. And you have a right hand side that you need to evaluate somehow. Um, now, if you look at the little graph, there's sort of a, a few things to keep in mind here. The black line, U, is the exact solution. Okay, we have no way of finding that. We don't know it. And in fact, we are representing, we are trying to look for the solution. Uh, it's sort of a, a linear space uh, spanned by V. Um, now, the, the, uh, the blue solution is the is the projection of the exact solution onto that linear space. Oh, hi, hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Hello? Yeah, did we lose his audio? Yeah, I think I we lost uh, his audio, but I, I don't think he can hear us either. Um, I, I'm not sure. Maybe he sent a chat, the director to him. Um, 
Why? Okay, why is it happening? <clears throat> Hey, hey, Dan. I'm sorry. Um, hey, Dan. Um, hello. I don't know. I, I I have no idea how to inform him. Um, about Can this. You, like stop his screen share. He'd see his notice that at least. Oh, okay. You can hear me. Oh, okay. We lost you. Like, yeah, I know. I know. I don't know okay. what happened. When oh, did you okay. lose me? Uh, okay, we we were with you with this slide. Um, here? No, next slide we were next with one. you. you yeah, were this here. one okay, we fine. were with you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And then you lost so you. My headset is getting tired, but okay. uh, but uh, fine. So so if you look at this model here, which is a well-known model, and you say, okay, so why one are the solutions you care about? Why two are the unresolved solutions? Uh, then, of course, you can integrate the second equation, uh, get an exact expression. You can plot that this is the first equation, and you get an equation just for the result scales or for the part of the solution that you care about. And 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 it's illustrative to sort of look at what the components are. So there is an equation which is just for the equations of this result scales. And usually when we were solving, if you were solving the first uh, system, and you couldn't afford to solve both for y1 and y2, you would just solve for y1, and that would give you the solution of y1. But of course, you would you would you would you would not get the interactions with y2. If you, on the other hand, look at the equation down here, you have two additional terms. It's an exact expression. The one to the very right is the effect of uh, of initial conditions that are in y2. Okay, so if you don't, if you have things that are expressed only in y2 but not in y1, then that error will accumulate in time. Let's take that error to be zero. In other words, the initial conditions are expressed only in the in y1. Then there's still a term which is a memory term, and this term basically accounts for the accumulation of the impact of y1, of y2 on y1. Okay, and uh, fine. So it's not a surprise. It basically means this is the term that accumulates the errors. Uh, this is an expect. This is a, this is a, an exact solution, an exact expression. But of course, it's not a very interesting expression because evaluating the memory term the way it's written is uh, is very very expensive. So it's not uh, it's for it's for inside only. And Chorin and Alexander Chorin, uh, 20 years ago, sort of worked through this and generalized it uh, to general systems of of uh, differential equations. Uh, I introduced the projection operator, but it gives you exactly the same sort of structure where you have, uh, let's say, y hat are the result scales, um, and y tilde are the unresolved scales. And then you have an equation which depends only on the resolved scales. Then you have something that depends on the initial conditions of uh, the components that are not expressed in y hat. And then you have the memory term. Okay, so again, we take big F to be zero. And in this whole exercise, enter something called a, called a projector. So at the at the bottom left, you have two uh, operators, P and Q. P is the projector, and, and Q is its, is its complement. Now, in the context of a reduced order model, you naturally have a projector because it is it is the projector that projects it onto the space that you have, and then there's the orthogonal complement. So you have a very natural way of thinking of what the projector should be, which is otherwise always a, a headache. But we still have the memory term. Now, what does the memory term do? Well, it accounts for the effect of all the scales that you have not taken into account over time. And understanding this is sort of the key uh, and and uh, fine, but and I just want to show you just to give you an insight because it gives a little bit of intuition. What does this kernel do? Well, if you look at this kernel K, how it behaves for something say like the I think the, this is the this is the viscous Burgers equation. You see that that uh, it's a kernel which decays very rapidly in time or in in, in time separation. It basically tells you that 
that uh, there's a finite time memory. If you make an if you make an error in the viscous burgers after a certain amount of time, you are no longer impacted by that error. It has washed out uh, because of the viscosity. Um, and then here we see that that if you think of the projector as the as the one that separates the scales, then as the projector gets gets more and more modes, and therefore the projection gets more and more accurate, the leftover uh, decays faster and faster. Okay, so this is this is what it shows. Um, but it has this sort of rapid decay if there's a, if there's viscosity. If it's a pure wave problem, then there's no decay, and it's a much more complicated problem. Um, now you can you can uh, play around with this. You can try to estimate these terms and so on. Uh, it's very problem dependent, and the terms the the, the bounds that you can get uh, in order to estimate the memory term are often very conservative. So we're going to look at it in a slightly different way because we have a reduced order model, and this means that we already have two pieces of information. We have the full solver. Uh, that we have to run in order to create the snapshots that allows us to build the reduced order model. And then we have the reduced order model, and that one we can run at very low cost, which means we can compare and we can generate data that says if the solution behaves like this, then the error between the high fidelity solution and the reduced order model is like that, and this is the correction that I need. So I can I can create a map between a history term, which is here alpha n and some what's back in time, and the error that I make between the reduced order model and the full and the full model. Okay. And so this is where we use uh, now a different kind of neural net, which is an LSTM, long short term memory uh, network, to train such that if I give the network a sequence of solutions backwards in time, it tells me what the what the what this memory term should be. And this can then be used to correct the solution. Okay, so it's a relatively simple idea once you go through the different steps. So here's I'll show you two examples and then we're at the end. So here's a here's a linear so now it's a three D problem, it's a linear problem. Uh it's an artery uh an artery, um, and the um, the forcing on the inflow is, is you can think of it as a heartbeat. Um, and uh, fine, here we go. And and the the solution uh, that we're generating, we are learning solutions for the period zero to four. Now there are a couple of things that we have to understand. First of all, we have to understand how many modes do we need in our reduced order model. You can do. do standard ways of doing that, um, we use 16. Okay, so for 16, we should have an error of the order 10 to the minus 3, something like this, which is probably enough. And the second question that you have to, to ask yourself is, well, these LSTMs, they have a number of cells, and they're somehow related to the length of the time history, but how many cells do you need? Now, it turns out that using the, the more expansive formulation, you can actually estimate how much memory you need. Um, and and this is actually what the what the what the black line here is in the two different uh paragraphs is all you need to know all you need to observe is that you can see that these horizontal lines that these lines which are which are for increasing of for different numbers of neurons in the in the LSTM you can see that there's sort of a dip or sort of a plateau in terms of the of the minimum accuracy and it, it aligns very well. In this particular case, it looks like we need four cells. Uh, so we can actually estimate the number of cells uh, in order to uh, to do what we what we would like to do. And so here are some results. So here we're just looking at the at the energy and not the pointwise solution, just the energy in the expansion coefficients. And um, uh, okay, so let's look. So zero to four again. This is the time that we have trained. 4 to 7 or 4 to 8 is beyond the training period. So now we're getting into phenomena that actually uh, the, the reduced order model has never seen. Nevertheless, the solution here is, is almost periodic, and you can see that the, the red line, which is what we predict, and the dashed line, 
which is um, the full order solution, uh, basically overlap. So you cannot see here visually a big difference. Um, but if we instead look at the arrow, you can see a big difference. So the blue line is the arrow in the solution uh, for different parameters uh, in the in the columns, um, and you can see that in the on the left, which is which is for the time periods where we have actually trained, so we know uh, we have used the information. You can see that by adding this memory term, you gain four orders of magnitude, sometimes six orders of magnitude, in accuracy over time. So this little memory term actually makes a big difference. Uh, even for a problem which is as simple as this one, which is sort of quasi periodic and and you can see that this this goes deep into the to the prediction where you actually predict twice beyond the training and still with an accuracy of maybe ten to the minus three on average compared to the solution with no correction where basically you have lost the solution uh very quickly, so that little correction actually matters. Yeah, snap, snap, snap sort of solutions, not so important. But let's look at the let's look at the at the uh, at the speed because at the end of the day, that's that's what's going to matter. Now, this is a linear problem. So the 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 light blue is the accuracy, is the time that it takes to solve um, to do um, to do one time step. Uh, as you increase the number of modes compared to the accuracy. Uh, of the overall solution. And you see that, let's say you take 28 modes in uh, in the full PUD, you don't do any correction, then uh, you get an error of maybe 10 to the minus 2. Now, with the, with the correction, you get the same accuracy with only 16 modes, which is nice, but it is more than twice as expensive in cost. And the reason for that is that the cost of the nonlinear problem, the cost of the linear problem, and uh, the PUD of the linear problem is very low. So for the linear problem, this is probably not a particularly interesting idea. So let's look at the nonlinear problem. So again, here's the two-day 2D Ray Le Bernard uh, problem, three layers again, and so on. We go through exactly the same exercise. Now we look at the solutions again. This is the energy exchange. On the left is the training. Now we train from zero to 50. On the right is the prediction. And you can see on the left, everything looks to be fine as you would hope for. On the right, uh, the LSTM does reasonably well, although of course, eventually the solutions drift apart, uh, but very, uh, very slowly. If you instead say, well, what, what happens if I just don't do the correction? Now, if I don't do the correction, so again, here there's there are um, uh, different parameters, and then there's the prediction, there's the training, and then there's the prediction. The red curve is the solution that you get if you don't correct. So you get a solution in the reduced order model, which is nicely periodic, as you would expect for the Ray Bernard convection, but the phase and the amplitude is completely wrong. So this is the worst kind of solution that you can do computationally because it looks right, but it's wrong. Um, and whereas if you do the correction, um, you get the the, uh, the dashed line and the blue line is the high fidelity. So you can see that that small correction actually throws it right back even into the uh, prediction uh, twice as far out as as, uh, as you want. And if we look at the solution here at the end, then, okay, so now you will have four pictures. So on the upper left is the full auto solution. So this is the full, this is the expensive solver. Uh, the one next to it is the projection of the expensive solver. So again, this is the best you can hope for if you want to compare. The lower left is the result using the PUD Galurkin, so the expensive solver with the full projection. And on the lower right is the one where you do uh, LSTM uh, in order to correct for the for the error the, for the memory term. So t equals 10, so you have just started. And you can see already here, the PUD Galurkin and the projection of the full solution are, are different. Whereas for the LSTM, the they're, they're differences are minimal. 25, we're still in the middle of the training. Um, so, so 
some sense the video store model should know what's going on, but it doesn't. 70, we're now into the prediction domain, and you can see that the, the pure decaloikin is completely overwhelmed by the errors that has been made because of the truncation. And here, 85, uh, the picture is the same. Again, the projection and the LSTM, um, or the one with the modified with the LSTM, uh, are basically indistinguishable um, uh, to the full order. So last thing is then cost. Well, now you can start seeing benefits. Because here, uh, if we say we have 24, this is the red bullet. Let's look on the, on the left. This is the red bullet. M equals 24 mode with the correction, uh, with the memory term correction, and the time takes, you know, 0.4 time 10 to the minus 2 for for a time step of an accuracy of, of uh, let's say, 10 to the minus 3, a little less than that. You get the same thing if you do 90 modes in the PUD, so in the fully intrusive approach, but it is three times as expensive. So when the problem is nonlinear, you can see the clear benefit of using a reduced order model, which is smaller, but accounting accurately for the error that you're making by learning what the memory term should be and applying it through the LSTM when you run the code. So a few final words here. Um, the idea that I've been proposing here is sort of a mix of things, but the idea is I don't like to think of of neural nets taking over uh, how we solve PDEs. But I do think it's important to ask ourselves if some of the bottlenecks that we fight with perhaps can be overcome. And, and that's what I've tried to demonstrate. The perhaps most attractive feature is that everything is non-intrusive. You can do these approaches for basically any problem. Uh, you can reduce the number of training by using the equation if you have an equation. Uh, and with the most fancy, you can correct for errors that you make in time, uh, especially if you want to go beyond the period of, of time where you have um, uh, trained. So you get into the prediction domain, which is obviously of interest. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. I don't know what the time is, but uh, I'm sure I'm at the end of it. And, and so, so thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Jen. Uh, uh, for the quick talk, uh, we have uh, about four minutes left for the Q and A session. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's okay. It's okay. It's, but um, so, if you have any questions, please um, please speak out because I don't see any questions on the chat room. <clears throat> so unmute yourself and then uh, try to uh, you know speak out your yeah, speak out. please. So while while we are waiting, um, I have one question for Jan. Um, you know, if your solution representation itself is is not good, like with a linear source case, you know, you know basis, um, then there is no you know hope that with that non-intrusive method you can get you can improve accuracy. Right? Oh, there's no magic here. <laughs> there's no magic, right? <laughs> Yeah. So if you so 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 you can do all of this, everything that I have described, you can do uh, with a really bad solver, right? I mean, the whole machine will work. You can build the reduced basis, you can build the model, you can learn the memory term, you can do all these sorts of things. But if the solver itself gives you generates a bad linear space, uh, well, then you're converging to a bad solution. Right, right. Is, is, do you, and have you th have you thought about um, to improve that um, the solution representation? Well, uh, so the model? yeah. So so the the the, the last t part of the talk sort of suggests that oh, but you know maybe you could use the same idea to get rid of of you know approximation errors somehow, right? Mm -hmm. But. But it's you very do. difficult to see how to do this because you you will you will need a way of estimating the error that you're making, but this you don't know, right? So you need you need a so so what 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 allows you to do this approach here is that you have you have a solver that mm -hmm. hopefully does a good job, mm -hmm. and then you build a reduced order model that hopefully is faster, and then you you learn the difference between the two so that you can do it fast and accurate at the same time. Mm. 
Okay. But if you don't have these sort of two solvers where one is fast and one is accurate, then you you can't really play this game. And of course, if 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 all you have is a very large and extremely complicated code, then you know it's not easy to see how to get that other piece of information. Well, uh, this is Jerome. Uh, I was thinking about that. What if you did it in a little bit of a three level? You know, you can think of running your uh, your black box code. You know, with different levels of mesh refinement. Yeah, you, know. you could probably do something like that. Yes, I agree. You could do something like that, that you, you sort of think of it as an extrapolation type uh, approach, and then you, yes, I agree. You could you could attempt something like this. And then in some instances, the black box code also has error estimates, not always. Yes, 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 yes. So if you, of course, if you have error estimates, you can you can you can play with that, and you can, but 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 yes, you could you could perhaps do some of this. I've never tried, but you could perhaps do some of the same things if you had. Uh, you know, you ran your code at different levels of resolution, and then you learn the error that you make, and then at the end of the day, you can run your your fast code, but with the correction, right? Which is what you're suggesting, and and uh, yeah, that's that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's worthwhile trying. I haven't I haven't tried. Also okay. because I mean I I have to say also because I'm you know I'm. I primarily work in in wave problems, wave dominated problems, and this this game of of uh, of uh, you know running at a coarse grid, it just doesn't work for wave problems. Right? Okay, thank you, Jan. Uh, time's up, and it's it's eleven. Um, so uh, let's thank uh, our speaker, Jan, today. And well, thank you, uh, thank you very much for your attention and for for, uh, for the opportunity. And oh, thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for... Uh